So I guess um, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit differently than the uh, previous two because um, I'm not a product person. I'm a, a software and agile kind of side of things person. Um, how many people in here are kind of more in the agile end of things than the product end of things? Cool. All right. Sweet. So. Um, and um, my topic was the, the human element of disruption. Um, and when I jumped into this, I uh, started realizing that there were some problems and that we were all using this word disruption, but I didn't think we had a common metaphor, um, which is kind of one of the rules of XP is need common metaphor. So, um, and I started going, actually, the way I'm hearing them all, all these words used, disruption, creativity, innovation, they kind of seem like we're all indicating the same thing. But obviously, there's a really big difference between saying we're disrupting ourselves versus we're disrupting a market. And actually, people act very differently to we're, dis we're innovating ourselves to disrupting ourselves. And the, so the words definitely matter, but I'm not sure that they're fundamentally getting at different things. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to kind of use them interchangeably. And I noticed Tom used them pretty interchangeably um, in, in his talk. So, so hopefully I'm on the right track. Um, I also noticed that when we looked at the human elements, and I'm going to talk more about that, that back innovation, creativity, disruption, that actually they're the same things that back motivation, agility, resilience, and even high performance. Um, so actually, all of this kind of base layer, the human layer of, of what we're doing inside our organizations, um, maybe, maybe that's actually the essence of business agility. And, and, and it affects all of these things. And we want all of these things. And luckily, it's all the same science. So, um, so I'm going to kick off by asking a question, um, which is, um, on a busy scale, how busy are you? And my, uh, I'm going to admit I'm in the top category, which I think I'm 120% busy. And that means that there's no way I'm going to get through my backlog. I have way too many options and things on, and there's just way too much demand. And most of the time, I'm trying to contract switch way too much, or the business expects way too much of me. Anyone else in that category? Cool. OK. Uh, that's actually pretty good for most audiences I've asked that question to. Um, and the next category is full backlog, which means you're pretty much 100% utilized, but you're kind of keeping your head above water. And, um, but, but there's no real time to stop and say, just read a book and get some slack time and be creative or innovative. Who's in that category? So I added a few more. Um, um, and then the third category, some occasional gaps. So that now and then, those moments pop up, and you go, Phew, and, and you can sit and go, Right, what am I going to do? How am I going to think forward? Um, anyone in that category? Only tentative hands going up. And then the last category is you've got dedicated Slack built into your day or your week, every day or every week. And you know how you're going to get that time to let your brain percolate and not be under pressure and actually think outside the box. Anyone? Cool. That's, that's amazing. Um, that normally is like less than 5% of the audience, right? And here it was like much more like 10%. 15%. But um, there was an interesting study done uh, uh, up the road at Oxford. Um, a bunch of researchers there decided to um, play psychology games like they like to. And they uh, took a, a bunch of people off the street and they ran them through an IQ test. And they ran them through the, uh, all the different pieces of the IQ test, but particularly um, focusing on uh, these uh, Ravens matrices. <laughs> which are the mechanism for checking whether or not you've got cognitive control and whether or not you're um, able to derive novel concepts and think outside the box. And, and they gave all of these people this IQ test, and then they sat them down and they had a chat with them about a problem that they'd had with their, um, that they uh, wanted to hypothesize they might be having with their car. And they basically put um, checked whether people were, and they gave people two categories. One, they, one group they told, like, it's going to be a, about 100 quid problem. You're, you're going to have to run or replace a tire or something. And the other group, they said, it's about a 1,500 quid problem. It's going to be a, a kind of a, a bit of major work going on on your car. And they checked before they asked those questions whether or not that amount of money was significant for those individuals. And they classed them as rich or poor in relation to that cost. And after the... Uh, telling them about this for a couple of minutes and just talking about this idea, um, they then uh, did another IQ test with them. And you maybe can guess where this went, but the result was that if you felt that that cost and, um, and that you were poor in relation to that cost, then the second IQ test, only minutes or hours later, you did 10 to 20% worse in thinking cognitively sideways 
innovating, disrupting in your own brain. So if we, as organizations, are not disrupting the way we interact with our people and innovating the way we react with our people, then probably we're putting lots of our people under these kinds of un unnecessary strains and we're probably destroying our ability to innovate and disrupt because we're stopping our people from thinking outside the box. And I think that's why many of the organizations set up a separate incubator or lab or try and get, get away from the big bureaucracy that's doing that to their people. And uh, given the number of hands that might be in that category, we're doing it to ourselves, yeah? And we might be, as agilists, the people meant to be campaigning against it. And I know I'm doing it to myself, yeah? So, um, so this is not a talk about uh, the product or the skills or the portfolio mechanisms or, or, or the labs that we might set up to, to disrupt. This is about what can we do with the human side of things to make it better, hopefully. And it's about disrupting ourselves. So the first thing I'm going to put on the list is uh, we need slack in our system. We need space to think for our people. If we don't do that and innovate and disrupt that inside our organizations, then uh, and we go down deadlines and stress and scarce time and resources models, then, then we're, we're screwing ourselves up. We're costing ourselves huge amounts. We're taking exceptional people and making them very average. Yeah. So after that, just a quick bit about me and, our, and the company. Um, um, so I'm. Doug Talbot, I'm the head of organizational effectiveness at Ocado Technology, um, and I run a group called the Catalysts. So I'm going to explain those few things because a few of those you may not have encountered. Um, so Ocado um, Group uh, has now kind of three parts, I guess, or, um, and the technology group is about 1,100 technologists who are part of the Ocado Group, which is about, I think, 13,000 people now. And we build all of the technology um, around the whole logistics chain of avocado, which includes um, crazy roboticized warehouses and um, driver gadgets and the website and the iPhone and the iWatch apps and all the, all the gadgetry, but we do pretty much everything. And we also um, do now uh, not only running the UK operation that you guys might be familiar with, um, uh, moving 50,000 product SKUs out out around the UK, but we also now sell our hardware and our software as a platform, as a service to our other large retailers around the world. So we've kind of done what Amazon did in taking, going from e-commerce marketplace to, to platform with AWS, and we're doing that now. Um, and I um, have a group called the Catalysts, and we're a really diverse team of people, and our job is to run around the organization and try and think about what can we do smarter, and that includes a lot of what you'd see in Agile coaching, but we've taken it further and we've blown that up and we've said we want to look at the micro and the macro and we want to look at the HR and the finance and the, the way we introduce our people and, and our tech models and, and, and we pretty much go and stick our nose into everything. Um, and I've got a psychologist on my team because the people part is really, really important. But it, um, a lot of this depends on what do you want to disrupt? So when we're talking disruption or innovation or creativity or whatever the word we're using at the moment is, what is it that our organization really wants to change and what do we want to attack? And I think we tend to be thinking two answers. We tend to be thinking moonshots. Um, I want to be the next Apple iPod kind of maker. I want to be the next Hive. I want to really take on a market and be that front runner. Um, and I think that uh, that's a really, really hard road to run. Um, and then the other side of it, which I think we can all do, however, at the other end, is we can create continuous improvement. We can create learning cultures. We can create growth mindset in our organization. And we can disrupt ourselves little by little on every decision that we do every day in every part of our organization. And I think that that's disruptive. And I think that that's lots of change for people. And we need to fit, um, help people be able to cope with that. Um, and most organizations, this is the McKinsey version of it. Um, there's a Simon Wardley version of it, which is the pioneers, the settlers, and the town planners, and, and drive, dividing your organization into those three groups. The McKinsey version is Horizon 3 is the 10x way out the front. The Horizon 2 is kind of 2x. What's your next product that you're going to take to market? How are you going to disrupt your current thing, and what's the increment on it? And Horizon 1 is the make lots of cash out of the thing that you're really working now. And this is their, their um, version of that. And there's a uh, if you've d heard of a book called Zone to Win by Jeffrey Moore, he also talks about dividing up your organization into these pieces. And I think we all do that, and um, Ocado definitely does it. Um, we, we're pretty good at um, 
uh, changing our current operational features and constantly innovating our day-to-day our -day, um, website and, and, and our grocery offering in the UK. And we're now doing 2x Horizon, which is we're doing hardware as a service to big retailers across the globe um, and building robots. In fact, I think we're now getting towards the Europe's largest robotics um, um, manufacturer or creator. I don't know what the right word is. Um, and, um, and we also go for 10x moonshots. We um, have um, several projects, but one of the ones that's been getting a bit of news and is on the web is we're trying to create, um, with many universities around the place, we're trying to do like um, handy helper men, uh, the, uh, robots, to help our maintenance guys in our centres. Um, and, and they've got to obviously know what tool and be able to just be talked to and grab a tool and pass it to the guy, that kind of thing. So, so we're trying to play in all these areas, but often, but this is really just tech and product innovation. This isn't people innovation. This isn't really disrupting ourselves. This is many of the things that, that Tom and Kat were talking about. Um, and, and I think that many organizations are stuck in that. And, um, and often we have this kind of um, distribution of people. We often have like 85% of our people churning the current business, a, a smaller percentage working on maybe that next product that we've managed to get the uh, board to sign up and put some decent chunk of money into. And then we've got like this small group of um, crazy geniuses in a corner, which we're hoping are going to somehow randomly invent the next iPod. Yeah? And, um, and how many people recognize that pattern at their workplace? Yeah, OK, not so many. But, um, but I guess I think that, that, that I'm really commonly seeing like a very, very small lab thinking 10x. And, and I think that that's causing three significant problems. I think that we're wasting a lot of brains. There's, if 95% of your organization is not thinking innovation and disruption, and we know that it's at least 50% serendipity or accident that you're going to be the next 10x inventor, um, then, then we're, we're wasting, I know in our case, um, at least 1,000 people's brains because they're head down doing that uh, I don't know, 100% backlog thing, yeah? Just generate more and more features. Just, just put them out, get them out, get them out, get them out, yeah? And, and that's, that's a waste of a hell of a lot of brain power. Two, uh, you know, we're still missing the human and innovation and the human change part of our organization. We haven't got enough dedicated focus on that. And actually, that's where our big multiplier is. And if we're not spending any money on that, then we're, we're kind of missing a, a huge opportunity. And um, and we're trying to pretend that we can crystal ball gaze with those guys far, far on the right. So those guys over there, we're, we're trying to crystal ball gaze, in my opinion. So, so what I, I guess we've been looking at and things we've been thinking about inside our organization and what my team is sort of dedicated to doing is, well, actually, we want a continuous learning culture that spans all of those horizons. We want a continuous learning culture built into a thousand tech people, not five tech people. And we also want to add a layer, which again my team is working on developing inside the organization, that are thinking about continuous learning culture at a human level. How can we reorganize constantly? How can we be pivotable? How can we be resilient? How can we be just generally innovative in our day-to-day -day lives? And this is a, a quote from uh, Ben Hammersley, who's a futurist in, in the, uh, I know he's in England, but I'm not sure about whether he's London area, but um, I heard this on a podcast recently and I, I loved it, which is, if you want to get out of, get to 2038 alive, then get out of 2008. And I think it adds another element to that diagram I just said, which is that I think that much of our tech in our big solid chunks of our business, the kind of 85, 95% of our business, is probably 1998, especially in, in most of the development software space that I'm in. It's like we're doing OO Java development and continuous delivery that we were talking about in 20 years ago. Yeah? And nothing's really heavily changed there. I don't count microservices as a major innovation. I'm sorry. Um, so um, so I, I think we're really living with tech that's kind of, and we're not really putting m anything more modern in the hands of our developers than that. Um, and we're trying in little bits of 10x, but there's not a real shift there. And in our product thinking, um, your average business for me is sort of 2008. We're all, well, Web2, yeah, cool, we've got e-commerce e online. And luckily, um, some of the people like IoT and things are coming along to try and change that, but most of our business models are still 
uh, quite, I think, 2008 product thinking, and, and the majority of the money we're making is off 2008 product thinking. So if you had those two things, people are panicking about moving those to 2018 or 2038, but, but really, should, let's, let's get them, let's move them a year forward first. Let's shift them. But the really worrying one is that most of our human innovation is actually probably 1880, if we want to talk about Taylorist management models um, and waterfall thinking and Gantt charts and all of that kind of thing. Our human dynamics, our process, was invented pre-1900. So, so that's the one I want to get to 2018 before I start worrying about 2038. Yeah. So. So what affects all of that innovation, retention, and motivation in your crew? Well, uh, this is a list of some of the stuff that my team has been digging up from um, academic uh, sources and also you know, looking across industry for the best practices we can find at the moment. And I don't believe in best practices, so the, the, the best good practices that we can find at the moment. Um, but we know that those are going to change like regularly and all the time. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of them and just do some chat about them. So. Um, we talked a little bit about Slack in the system, and I gave you that one example from uh, from the research at Oxford. But um, but that's like repeated time and time and time again. And actually, one of the interesting things about that Slack in the system is that um, if we look at scarcity as a as a generic idea, and we stop going, actually, we're just going to make you feel worrying about a little bit of money going out. But actually, we put you make you time poor, or we make you a little bit fearful of blame, or we give you any sense of, of fight or flight, then your stress hormones come on, and that's what triggers a lot of that narrowing of vision. I'm not going to look outside the box. I'm not going to try and do anything other than what you've told me to do. And if we're paying thousands and thousands of really bright brains to just do what they're told, then we've basically moved them back to 1880, into Industrial Revolution, and put them in rows at machines again, yeah, and we're not really letting them be our innovation and disruption. Um, so there's a lot of um, focus on how do we avoid deadline thinking, how do we avoid pressure models, how do we avoid artificial um, constraints and, and talking about that with our developers and our, and our smart minds, our thought workers like you guys, and how can we focus more on flow efficiency, how can we focus more on um, uh, making the work move through our system the best we can at a sustainable pace, all of those kind of classic lean and agile thinking. Yeah? And there's really, really good academic backing for this. So a couple of other things that are, turn out to be really, really essential in all of the research and um, examples and case studies are clarity of purpose and mission. So um, if your people don't know where they're going, then they act in a fear way by default. So if you put someone, they basically become agoraphobic. So, so basically if you aren't making it really clear what the constraints of your system are and leading with a mission and uh, helping people know what their product is, who's the customer, how it's going to affect, then they will default to um, entrenching because they know that in risky systems and in, in traditional hierarchies and big organizations, if you duck your head down when you're not sure what you should be doing, then you're going to be safer. So, so one of the things we've got to watch out for is making sure that we make the mission and the boundaries really, really, really clear and that we're going to get them to stand up and be a cat and look outside the walls. Yeah? Um, and obviously, if we want to reverse the culture that creates that, then we want to think about how can we drive transparency and trust. And these won't be anything new to any of you as, as agilists out there. Um, we talk about these kind of values in almost all of the agile games. And, and the key is that if people have that information, they, they will think more cleverly. Um, and um, it was described um, by Tom that, that it, when he gets all of those uh, different brains together, amazing things happen. Well, uh, funnily enough, that's been researched and, and that's really well backed up as well. We want to put diverse people together for creativity. There is some good research that shows if all you want is someone to crank out the same thing time and time again and you just want productivity, homogenize your team. Um, but if you actually want thought workers who do creative things and don't just repeat, 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 you want to help them have diversity around them. You want to bring other thinkers into the puzzle make, um, design surface or, or where you have those conversations. Um, and the other thing that we're finding is 
because people are often not in these kinds of environment, they're not given the, the trust and the safety and the, and the space and, uh, and, and they're often under pressure and things, that people have actually turned off a lot of their skills to work in this way. So one of the other things we, have to, we can realize is that um, there's huge research in neuroplasticity and growth mindset. You've probably heard all of those kind of terms as, as agile coaches or, or people in the agile space. Um, and that we can teach people to reactivate that innovation thing. And that might mean that the very first time you say run a hackathon or, or some exercise to help them exercise that bit of their brain, they're really crap at it. And, and I can tell you that that's my experience in several organizations is that we go in and we, we say, cool, let's have an innovation day. Let's, let's all get together for a day and innovate. And most people just look at you blankly and, and like go, no, I'd like to go and fix bugs, please. And, 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 and actually, that's because we've institutionalized them. Yeah? Our organizations have institutionalized them. And we actually have to create a space where they aren't fearful, where they have psychological safety and trust, and, and they can see that they're going to be safe to do that. And that takes time. You're not going to get that in, in two weeks. You're not going to get that, probably, in a year. You've, it takes a lot of effort to, to shift an entire organizational culture so that people trust. So things that we can really proactively do to put this into action um, is is we have to work with our leaders. And if uh, you are a leader in here, or you, you as a, an agile coach maybe, or a product owner, then you have some form of leadership in your organization, um, and you have influence to make these kinds of things happen. So um, you know, for, if, if it's not happening at a big scale in your organization anyway, it's not the culture of your organization anyway, then form a buddy group and start creating a bubble where, they, where it is safe and, and, and start creating that mechanism. And so one of the things we did inside our organization just recently is we renamed all of our managers to organizational engineers. And we didn't want them to keep on this whole bandwagon of command and control, basically. We wanted people to realize that their role was to create the environment we've just been talking about, to apply all the psychology and the research we've been talking about, and to apply servant leadership, if you will, to go back to kind of classic agile memes, but uh, maybe um, participative and visionary leadership or leadership by intent, there's many ways of, that people are talking about it now, and we wanted to apply that into our organization. We had to therefore take away this picture of command and control hierarchy in their head a bit. So we've been talking about organizational engineers. And we're now teaching them a new set of skills to go with that. Um, and so things that they have to do is they need to be super present and really reactive to problems and challenges. They can't just let things ride and, and someone comes to them and taps them and says, um, I've got this really neat idea. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you. Or um, if they're not walking the walk immediately, if they're not reacting and, and creating that thing, then people aren't going to believe it's going to happen. Yeah? So um, they need to walk and talk the practice. So they've got to now think about how daily can I be talking about um, trust? How daily can I be talking about how we um, work to avoid um, pressure situations? How can I stop taking on more work in progress? How can I make sure um, that um, that I'm doing a quality job and that I'm thinking outside the box? How can I make sure I'm working a little bit of gap into every day to slack, to think outside the box? And luckily, many of you had that, but I'll bet you many of your developers don't. Um, and, um, and make sure that happens. And then, uh, kind of, I think I've got two more things, which is we've got to make that ability to innovate really low cost. So again, if someone raises an idea, we've got to have a mechanism already set up, a system in our organization for those ideas to get watched and funded and taken somewhere valuable really, really quickly. Otherwise, if there's a, oh, it'll get done in three months' time, then people go, oh, I really can't be bothered um, waiting around. Or actually, it's too much effort to go through the bureaucracy to raise this idea. So I'm just not going to bother raising the idea. And you lose it all because they just go, they think about it for a fraction of a second, and they go, oh, no, no, that would be, that would be painful. Yeah, so we've got to make it really low cost. And we've got to then show people how, and we've got to get there in there and teach them how to um, rely on that intellect, rely on that instinct, and, and be creative. And there's some really interesting um, exercises that help people do that. And, uh, and I think even some of them now being built into the apps like Headspace and, and um, the kind of brain training apps that you can buy and things. But there's some really good research coming out on how to do that. 
and finally empower people, allow them to throw ideas around, dissent, get into conflict discussions, but safe conflict discussions, and then move on together. And, and the, there's no blame when you fail and stuff like that. So, so we talk about learn fast inside of Cardo technology. We talk about, we don't want to fail fast, we want to we wanna learn as fast as we can, and that means data, that means experiments, that means um, some fails and some successes. And, and as long as we're learning from it, we almost don't consider it a fail. So, so that's kind of the message we're trying to get out. So that's my really speedy run through of, of um, the, the, the human element that we're trying to plan at Ocado Technology.